Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Bible study. My name is still Sandy Lestitole, and I am still looking at theology proper as part of the series of the importance of doctrine. Last week's foundational scripture went as follows. It was Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is mighty and it is powerful. We thank you that tonight we are going to learn more about who you are and what you are in our lives. And we are going to, you are going to expand our memories and that you are going to expand even our spirit man to hear you instead of hearing us. Father, as we talk, we ask you that you cover us with your blood, Lord Jesus. And I thank you as you receive glory and honor in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, since we're still on the series, The Importance of Doctrine, and we are looking at, it, at a subtopic of theology proper. Last week, we looked at the topic of theology proper and what it means um, to you and I. And we looked, when we said it was the doctrine of God, we looked at the existence of God. We said to us, can we ever know that God exists? And we even explained that the world around us and ourselves are proof that God exists. We looked at various arguments, theological arguments, that look at the existence of God. And the, those were cosmological, teleological, ontological, and the moral arguments. And they showed us that God does exist. In fact, if you look at yourself, look at the way you are made, and look around you, look at the world around you, you'd get a sense that God does indeed exist. And so we also delved a little bit into scripture and we looked at Isaiah and how the chapters 45 to 46 tell us about who God is and what is he like and how we should relate to him. We learned that God is eternal. We learned that God is self-existent. And also we learned that God is three persons in one. So there's one divine essence, but um, there are three uh, distinguishable persons, but they are indivisible, and that is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so we went on to, at the end, to the arguments about the existence of God, and we said, look at ourselves and how we get a conscience and how we always strive to do what is right through the pricking of our conscience and we learn that God indeed has put this thing in us that continuously tells us that God exists. And we, our argument was based on if we deny this basic intuitive belief that God exists, then we would not be denying ourselves, our very existence. And we would not be able to understand who we are and the world around us. So now let us continue and let us find out um, what this God is like. Um, we will look at just particularly that God, we get to talk about God as having a character. And so if we were to discuss what these characters are, we would classify them as communicable and incommunicable attributes. So when we are talking about communicable attributes, we are looking at what God shares with us, what God communicates to us. That is, we are able to experience God's love and we are able to share God's love with other individuals. Um, we are, God is knowledgeable also, and uh, that God has mercy, God has justice. All those God is able to share with us because we are able ourselves to exercise it towards our fellow brothers and sisters. However, God has other attributes that he does not share with us. At the moment, we do not exist in eternity. Um, I can only exist in one place, and that is here and now. I do not know what you are up to in your own house, and possibly even in this room, I cannot tell what the other individuals are up to outside of this room. So that means that I do not have omnipresence, and also I do not have omnip omnipotence, that is the strength of God the all power that God has, the almighty power that God has. I do not have such things. So I do not share those things with God. 
So if I were to understand God um, and look at the attributes that he shares with me, um, I, I don't completely share those attributes. For example, God has an infinite great amount of love for me. But me my, and my love, it's imperfect. Yes, I will share love with my fellow brothers and sisters, but I do not have the infinite amount of love that God has. And let's look at God's wisdom also. God is able to share his wisdom with me. For example, I'd be able to know what um, I need to do in a specific situation that I've never been at before. Um, God would give me that wisdom, but I would not be able to do more than what God is able to do in certain areas. So God is infinitely wiser than I am. So in order to understand God, I'd have to understand his character. Normally, um, a person's name is, describes the kind of per person that he or she is. So to understand God, we've got to look at the many names that, he, um, that the Bible says that he has. Let's look, for example, at Hagar as um, when she was pregnant and she went into the, when she was chased by Sarah and she needed water and in the desert she couldn't figure out where she could find water. And so when God opened her eyes, she saw a well and she was able to get water um, from that well. And so she named God El Roy. So that is a God who sees me. So we see that the name of God comes from a character, that he is an all-seeing God. Let's look at Abraham as he was about to offer Isaac in the mountain. And when Isaac asked him, Father, I see that there's the wood, um, there's the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide. And so God became Jehovah Jireh. So that is a God uh, who provides. And so Abraham related to God. Um, he understood God's character and who God was according to what God could do. And that is provide. And there's many other things. For example, let's look at what God created. God created the nation of Israel. And God was, to Israel, was known as the Holy One of Israel. So that also gives us a, a sense of what God is and who he is. So we know also from the names that God receives. For example, Jehovah, that is, I am. So if you read Exodus chapter 3, 20, um, when Moses uh, asked God, um, and he says, what do I tell the people uh, as to who you are? He's, he, God says, tell them that I am he who he is. So, for example, I will be who I will be. So that is a personal name that God wanted um, the nation of Israel to know him as. So he was going to be, Israel was going to be a treasured possession to God. And so Israel was going to refer to God as Jehovah. And let's look at us. Um, in the New Testament, when we pray, and we are to call God our Father. So that is, indicates that God can relate to me, that he is someone that I can talk to. However, as much as I'm able to understand God, there are certain limitations that I have um, that God does not have. So God is infinite. So he does not experience, for example, the temporal uh, needs that I have. For example, God does not feel hunger. God does not feel tired. God does not feel the need to go to sleep, for example. So we understand that he is far greater than anything that I've ever imagined him to be. And as a personal God, that means that I can relate to him. I can pray to him. I can obey him when he speaks to me and commands me. Um, I can respond to his love. I can, he also rejoices in me and loves me. So that's the kind of God that he is to me. So what do I know uh, truthfully about the person of God? I mean, we know many things out there. There are many arguments and there are many movements out there that tell us about who God is. For example, if we look at the New Age movement, they say God is the force. God is the planetary conscience. Uh, in human beings. And they claim that God is all in all. I mean, all of that um, sounds very pantheistic. That is um, an idea that 
God is everywhere. He's in matter. Uh, God is substance. Uh, God is everything. So that can't be that what God truly is. So what does the Bible teach us about who God is? We know in John 4, 24, it says God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And also, if you remember from the example we made um, last week about uh, in Deuteronomy 4, about how God appeared to Israel in the mountain. God was a spirit. God was incorporeal. That is, uh, he had no physical parts. Um, God had no physical passions like I do. Um, so God is free from all temporal limitations. God was invisible. Um, it told me that God was without an earthly counterpart or resemblance. So therefore, they, the Israelites were not meant to make anything from what is in this world and compare it to the God that we, um, that we worship. So there is no form that we can say, here, yeah, this is what God is. So what do I know God to be? So the Bible teaches me that God exists, but it, it talks about that he, it, it, he exists as a triunity. So there's a Godhead. So it, the Bible teaches me that God not only exists as a personal spirit, but that he does so in a holy trinity. So in my mind, this holy trinity is mind boggling. I cannot understand what it is. I mean, um, if I were to study the Bible clearly and I can never truly fully understand what it is now in this world. But let's see what the Bible says about God's triunity. So what does uh, a simple dictionary tell us about um, the, what tri Trinity means? It says the union, it, it is the union of three divine per persons. Uh, that is the hypostasis. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one divinity. So that all three are one God as to substance, but three persons. That is hypostasis as to individuality. Okay, if you look at last year's teaching on ecclesiology, you would have realized that there were many arguments about the church and there were many doctrines that um, were fought over. And this one particularly was more contentious in the sense that a lot of people had an argument about who God was and um, how um, each one, each person of the divinity um, differed from the other, whether one was subordinate to the other. And eventually, if we looked at Tertullian's argument, he said, God is a triune God. If there are three persons, they are distinguishable, but they are indivisible. That is, there is only one God, one Godhead. So from looking at the dictionary, we can understand that there's a threeness or there's a trinity is formed out of um, the word tri means three and niti, that is unity. That means that God is three in one. Now, when we talk about the personality of God, we're not talking about you and I. I mean, it means that I'm, I have an identity which is completely distinct from the next individual. I am different. That means I have my own will. Um, I, there's nothing um, that my family or my brother or my sister, my true relative siblings that they could have that is similar to me. It's, but with God, I cannot think of him like that. Otherwise, then I think of three gods if I talk of God as a person. So what do we mean by all this? We're saying that the persons are inseparable, they are interdependent, but they are eternally united in one divine being. Let us look at the character of the doctrine of Trinity. It states that there is one God who is one in essence or substance, but three in personality. Let's look at the verse uh, in Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let's look at the word one. If you look at the original term uh, in Hebrew, if you were to describe this one, it's called Echad. So it's E-C-H-A-D. So what does it mean? It means 
For example, if you take a stack of twigs and you bind them all, and if you were to look at them, they are a unit, they are one. So that's what we look at God as. They are all one substance. Um, so that is one. But we're not looking at each individual twig as separate from the other and independent of each other. That would be yakhed. So that is meaning uh, the number one, as in when you count one, two, three, differentiating different items. So that's what God is. He is ekhad. That is, he is a unit. So that was, that is what the scripture tells us. It gives us that sense. So this does not mean that now that there are three independent gods that exist as one, but there are three persons who are co-equal, co-eternal, inseparable, interdependent, and eternally united in one absolute divine essence and being. So never think of God as having a different essence with each one being subordinate to another. So we're going to take a look at what I mean by that a little later in uh, this topic. So if we look at most um, religious formularies, what do they say about the essential being of God? They say that God has three persons. They are not separate, um, but they and they don't form distinct individuals. But it, they argue that God has three modes in which the divine ex essence exists. That is how we should think of God, not as a separate, rational, and moral individual. So, but in his being, there are no three individuals, but there are three personal self-distinctions within one divine essence. But then, if we look at personality, it tells us about independence of will, actions and feelings that lead to a behavior that is peculiar to a person. So if you know me, there are certain things that are peculiar to me. If I know you, there are things that I would recognize um, about you. If, for example, if you look at my handwriting, it's only peculiar to me. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, um, the things that um, I like, for example, they're only peculiar to me. And so, the same, similarly with you, there are certain things that are peculiar to you that makes you a personality and an individual. That means that you are self-conscious and you are self-directing. You never um, act independently, independently or in opposition to what you are. But when we look at God, so we say that God is a unity. That is, in himself, a threefold, he is a threefold center of life. His life is not split into three, but he is one essence in personality and in will. So when we say that God is a triunity, we say that there is a unity in diversity. That is, diversity manifests itself in God's persons, in characteristics and in operations. Let us look at these three persons. So they are perfect in equality of nature, honor, and dignity. So the fatherhood belongs to the first person of the Godhead. So that is, that, that's where, where all eternity comes from. And it is a personal property of God from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. But the son is a unique um, talks about him being a unique individual, not as in from, as in where he came from, no, as in who he, in his position to the father, he is unique to the father. Um, that is what we find uh, often when Christ speaks to his disciples and when he's answering the Pharisees, he always talks of himself and the father being one. And um, that. That's what, why the Jews, when um, he said things like that, they understood that there's only one God. They can never be God's son. So when Christ was saying that him and God are the same, he was virtually equating himself to God 
but it was against the Jewish principle of Echad, that is God being one. And so then they were seeking to kill him and they were seeking to stone him. And when he said things like that, because then it was, they found it difficult that God could exist in heaven and here on earth and they could see him, but he was still in heaven. And also we get to understand the spirit. That is, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, we know that Paul said that it is the spirit of God that is able to search the things of God. And he knows the things of God. He knows the thoughts of God. So that means that the spirit um, is God in nature. So nothing else that is not God in nature would be able to know what God is like and what God is. So the spirit was the one who was to reveal who God is to, uh, to us. So he was God himself in the innermost essence of his being. So let us look at how God works. Um, we know that we received salvation through Christ. And, but it is the spirit that awakens our spirit man to the truth of God. But where do all these things, uh, who do they work for? They work for the father. So it is the father who sent the son. And the son now is made known to us by the spirit. And so the son's office is to reveal the father. And the spirit's office is to reveal the son. As Jesus says, um, in John um, 16, that when he comes, he will glorify him and he will declare what is his to us. So that's what the spirit did. So it, it, it convicts us. It tells us that there is a Lord Jesus that we must have faith in. That we are, uh, for example, when we are first regenerated, we are cut deep in our hearts and we get to understand that there is God. And so we come to have faith in this God that we say exists. Um, however, there is no, in the, in the Old Testament, there's nothing really that we could tangibly say that here it is, it says triunity. Uh, it's written in clear black and white. Often that's the argument because people would say, where in the Old Testament does it say, oh, uh, God is, is a triune God? But Look carefully at the language, for example, of Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our own likeness. And we will continue. So God made them, he and him. So it changes um, from being, uh, God changes from using a plural pronoun to a singular um, pronoun of himself. So what does that tell you? It gives us a sense that there are instances where we get to pick out the triunity of God. Let's look at God's um, name. For example, in Genesis 1, uh, it says, In the beginning, God, and that word God is translated as Elohim. And so we know that Elohim is the plural form of El. So that tells us that there is a plenitude which points to the power and majesty of God. Uh, it, it certainly allows for this New Testament revelation of the triunity of God. Um, let's look at the work of creation. It is stated that God created um, heaven and earth. But who was moving upon the earth? It was the Spirit. But God spoke the word. So who, um, when it, the Bible argues that the word of God made things to exist. And we know that the word of God, that is logos, that is the expression, that is the discussion about God. But we focus particularly on the expression of God because God expressed himself and things were. For example, when God says, let us make man. So then man was created. But then um, then God got to the nitty gritty of forming a body and God went into the nitty gritty of giving us eyes, legs, arms, um, a mouth, and so that we'd be able to interact with this 3D world. So that's what God did. That's God's work in creation. 
But, and also you would see th um, that it was the Spirit who moved over the earth and He infused life in us. He infused life in everything that is animate in this world. So that is, you find that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit participated in the work of creation. Um, let's look at Isaiah 9. Uh, verse 6, um, when the Messiah is uh, prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, he is, uh, is revealed to be equal to God because Isaiah calls him mighty God, eternal father. I mean, how is it that um, an Old Testament saint understands the Messiah to be eternal and to be a mighty God or an eternal father? So that's just Jesus being referred to being um, like God the Father. So it gives us a sense of there being a triunity of God. Let's look at um, Psalm 110 uh, verse 1. David speaks um, of a distinction between um, the Lord speaking to his Lord. I mean, you will imagine Jesus' word. Um, uh, Jesus' teaching when he asked um, the Pharisees when they were questioning him uh, about his identity. And then he said, who was David referring to when he says, um, the, the Lord said to my Lord. And then they couldn't answer him. But David here is in indicating that this Lord, as in my Lord, if you look at the scripture of um, Psalm 110 verse 1, that he wasn't just any ordinary person. He was the king that was to come. He was the Messiah. Um, he was his own Lord. He was a master at Adonai. Um, he was one who was God himself. Um, so you, we get a sense that God, the first person, addresses God, the second person. This is precisely what Peter tells us when he talks about uh, the resurrection of the Messiah as anticipated in the Old Testament. And also we find that there's, um, they talk in, in Isaiah about a Redeemer being distinguished from um, the Lord. So you see in Isaiah 7.14 that the Redeemer is distinguished from the Lord. Again, we find, uh, let's look at the scripture in Hosea so that we can get to understand this and take a look at the, um, what Hosea says. Let us read Hosea 1, verse 6 to 7. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Loruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow nor by sword nor by battle by horses nor by horsemen let's read again carefully the scripture and uh, if you look at verse 6 it's if you look on into verse 6 it says and God said we find God speaking but then suddenly God says I will save them by, their, by the Lord their God. How is it that God says, um, speaks, but then he says he will save Israel by the Lord their God? So who is he referring to? Is there, um, was he talking about another person in the Godhead there? Or was he uh, referring to himself? But if you look carefully, you will see that God is referring to another person. Um, person of the Godhead. Again, let's look at um, Isaiah 46, 18. Um, we see that the Spirit there is distinguished from the Lord. Um, the Spirit is different. When Isaiah speaks about the Spirit there, um, he is distinguished as being different from the Lord, but not as in um, not a Lord himself. He is a Lord as well. And, but there's also another Lord. So we get a sense of this triunity of God. We get a sense of this echard of God as God exists in one. 
Also, when you, we look at uh, Isaiah 14, when uh, 7, 14, I beg your pardon, as the Messiah was being prophesied, it is made clear that the one who would be born of the virgin would also be, be Emmanuel. So if you look at the name Emmanuel, Emmanuel means uh, with us. El means God. So that would be someone who is with, it would be interpreted as God with us. So this Messiah was going to be indeed regarded as God with us. So he was going to be an incarnate God. But God is in heaven. And the Israelites would argue, we cannot have God here with us and in heaven. And we see him and walk with us and interact with us. It didn't make sense to them. Um, if, if, uh, that's why they, when Christ came, they couldn't accept that he was indeed eternal. That he was indeed who, uh, he who was promised. He who was eternal. He who was going to be the king that would save Israel from um, its waywardness. So Christ was the, a mighty God, the eternal father that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. I mean, if you can imagine the time span uh, from Isaiah's prophecy to the time when Christ was revealed, um, it, it didn't make any sense. Let's look again also. I, I love the book of Isaiah because it gives us a clear uh, understanding of this triunity of God. Look at Isaiah 61 verse 1 and you would see also in, in Luke when the Lord Jesus read from the scripture about how the spirit of the Lord was on him and where he was now there to open the eyes of the blind, to open the ears of the deaf and where the lame would be able to walk. I mean, and then he says, here yeah, in my presence, the scripture is fulfilled. How? And you would think that, imagine God, imagine a mighty God coming and interacting with me and be able to physically touch him, uh, be able to um, know who, what he's like and have a relationship with him. It was impossible to Israel, to Israel because of the of God's revelation in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where God didn't have any form, where God only spoke from the mountain, where they could only hear the thunder of God and where they could only hear the voice of God through the fire. And when the mountain shook and they were fearful and then they closed their eyes because they didn't want to see this God. But God now was saying, I want to know you. I want to be a father to you. I want to have a relationship with you. So that's what God was now revealing himself to be like because he was seeing that Israel was wandering all over the place and they didn't, uh, they were misinterpreting um, God's revelation. And so Christ appeared so that they could have the correct re revelation of who God was. But however, we see that even though that Christ was um, revealed, he was not any different than who the father was. He was one with the father. He was not um, divisible. So that means that he was not a different individual that was subordinate in, as in um, Christ was then created by God, but he was begotten from God. Um, so we've talked to you about how God is to be called um, a father. And when we pray, and we often hear Jesus declaring that about his father, often his father. And he'd got, he'd get himself uh, into a lot of trouble with all of that. How is it that a man like you and I experiencing a 3D world could eventually call God his father? I mean, that was totally mind boggling to the Israelites. They had a difficult time understanding who this God was. They couldn't get, a sense, get their heads wrapped around that God was meant to be a father to them. Um, but Jesus often was saying that he was one with God and that God was a father to him. And with Israel, that was blasphemy. They just wanted to there and there to just kill him. 
Because in Israel, they knew only God never to having a form like you and I. He could never exist in a human form. But God did because he cared um, for his people. Because he wanted his people to be um, what he wanted them to be. He wanted them to change their ways and come to him. So let's look at the person of Christ in the New Testament. Who is he? I mean, um, John 1.1, 1, 1, like how we spoke last time. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, John simply just declares that, I mean, it's brilliant and clear that Jesus is God. Huh? Jesus is God? Impossible. I mean, how often have we spoken to other people of other denominations and you say that Jesus is God and they tell you, no, 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 Jesus is the son of God. And you say, oh, Jesus is God. And, you, and they just think you are crazy. Jesus, they see him as being not God, but a son of God. Um, but how is it that he's not God? Let's look at scripture, how his deity is proven by the divine names given to him. Let's look at what he was doing. Let's look at his name, Jesus. I mean, it means God saves. Indeed, he was God and he came to save. He came to save those that were lost. That is his name. So, and also, what did Jesus do? Jesus was doing things that were beyond um, what people could comprehend. For example, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind. Jesus was opening um, was ears of the deaf and the mutes were able to speak. Those were things that God could do. Jesus also forgave sins. I mean, oh boy, when he said, uh, pick, uh, your sins are forgiven. Oh, what blasphemy that was, uh, according to the Pharisees. But that's what Jesus came to do, to forgive sins. Let us look at his role. Um, it says uh, in John that Jesus created um, the world. So we understand, we, uh, and also we see that uh, it says by the, his word, the worlds were framed. And we understand that the word me, could um, mean that Jesus. So we know if the worlds were framed by God's word and the word is God, then we can see and equa uh, logically say that Jesus definitely is God. So you can also look at um, Colossians 1.16 where it talks about uh, Jesus being the one who is the one who created everything. And let's look at um, future judgment. Okay? If you look at John 5.27, it talks about, um, Jesus says that the Father gave him the authority and that he was going to be the one in the future to judge. But Israel understood that to only be the work of God. And only God could judge. And so Jesus claimed that position. Jesus claimed that he was going to be the one who was going to be giving out judgment. But then to us, it didn't make sense. Or to, should I rather say to people like you and I back then, to Israel, it didn't make sense. Because they, for them, God was spirit. God did not have a body. And God was up in heaven and you, no one could ever see God and live. And so the, it necessitated God to hide Moses in a rock so that he's able um, to see God's past work. But hasn't God then hidden us in a rock? Hasn't, uh, hasn't God put us in Jesus, who is a rock, that would, so that we can experience who God is, so that we can have a relationship with this God by the Spirit, and then we can know the Father as being a father to us. That's what um, the Bible argues. So let's look at Jesus' divine attributes. Jesus is eternal. That is John 17, 5. Um, it talks about um, when um, it, it talks about Jesus being eternal, being um, from of old. 
Um, if also looking at Matthew 28, as Jesus was um, giving the final um, assignment to his disciples, he says, I will be with you everywhere. And that tells us that we know as I'm standing here, Jesus is with me. Jesus is also with you where you are, in your own home. And he's able to interact with you. You're able to experience him as you um, are with us, following with, with us in this Bible study. That's what Jesus is able to do in heaven right now. So that is, he's confirming his work, uh, sorry, he's confirming his word um, as I'm doing this to you, this Bible study. So in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, it talks about Jesus being um, omnipotent, that is having all power, that is um, someone who's powerful, who's stronger than anything I've ever imagined. I mean, often we've seen the Olympics and we see people taking the weights and then we know someone who's going uh, to win the gold medal is someone who's able to lift um, the biggest and heaviest of those uh, weights. That is, we regard that as somebody who's strongest in the world because they've competed about, about with many people in the world. But if you think of Jesus, he's stronger than that person who won gold in the Olympics. That's what Jesus is. He's more powerful than they are. Um, Jesus is everywhere. So he knows everything. He's omniscient. So if you look at Matthew 9, 4. Um, so you find that it talks about Jesus knowing the hearts of the Pharisees. He know, knew what they were thinking. Um, so before they even said anything, it's, the Bible always says, but the Lord knew what they were thinking. And so he would answer them. They'd be utterly amazed. How is this man who is a competent um, son could know all these things? His mother is Mary. We know his brothers, Judas, Simon, and everyone else. How is it that he's able to do all these things? And, and that is what, um, remember when God, uh, Jesus was asking Peter whether he loves him? And then Peter says, oh Lord, you know everything. So that is it. Jesus was displaying uh, his omniscience uh, power. And also, if you look at um, um, the confession of Thomas, Thomas um, would never believe when the, his brothers were uh, telling him that they've seen the Lord. Then he says, no, until I put my fingers in his hands, I put my hand on his side, then I shall believe that he's alive. Then when Jesus, um, then when Thomas was with his, with his brothers, uh, then Jesus appeared. And he says, put your hands uh, in my, put your hand on my side and put your finger on my hand. But Thomas confessed and said, my Lord and my God. But did Jesus rebuke Thomas for calling him Lord and his God? No, he didn't. He accepted worship from Thomas because we all understand that only God accepts worship. And we know that God will not share his um, glory with anyone else. But God, uh, that is Jesus, accepted that worship from Thomas. But we compare this to Peter when uh, Cornelius knelt down trying to worship him. What did Peter do? He rebuked Cornelius and he said, no, 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 please don't. I'm the same like you. Only give worship and honor to God. Um, there are many other um, scriptures that we can look at that declare um, the Godship of Jesus. I mean, I've spoken of John 1, 1, where it speaks of his deity. Uh, you can look at John 20, um, verse 28 as well, that Jesus definitely is God. And there's a whole lot of other things that you can look at. Um, lots of other scriptures that you can look at that would recognize Jesus as God. But how's about the Holy Spirit? I know there are some that argue that the Holy Spirit is just a force of God, that he's nothing else but just a wind that blows and God, um, and it, it's just not God. But we know that the, when Peter was rebuking um, Ananias and, and Sapphira about, about their lies. He says, how can you lie to God? How can you lie to God? P 
Peter declared that the Holy Spirit was God. Again, we've looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, where we said the Spirit is able to search the mind of God. So if the Spirit is able to search the mind of God, then is He not God? And even Paul says, don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? And who is God? So then that means that He is, so through us, then the Holy Spirit is able to be everywhere. So we are able to experience God by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So each and every one of us, wherever we are, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And so He is everywhere. He is at work in you. He is at work in me. He is at work in your friend's house. He is at work everywhere around the world. So that gives us a sense of the Godship of the Holy Spirit. And also that the Holy Spirit um, regenerates. And we know that only God gives life. But when you and I got saved, we got um, Zoe life. That is God kind, God kind of life. Our spirit man was regenerated. We are created to be a new creation. And only God creates. But we, that was done to us because the spirit moved uh, wherever he wished. And so when we uh, recognized and we heard the um, word of God being preached to us, then we repented and we were regenerated and given life. So then there must be, a, so all of this, the regeneration, we know that it must be um, of necessity and it is a work of God and only God has this power to give life. So then what do we know? That the Holy Spirit name often he is regarded as the spirit of Christ we've already proven that Jesus Christ is God and also he's referred to as the spirit of our God and so we know that he is then this God so that now brethren at home understand this one thing that God is one we are able to experience the father because he has given us the son but we are able to know of the Father through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That is what um, the work of God does in us. That is how we are able to experience the fatherhood of God. And so I'd like to ask all of us now as we end our tonight's Bible study to actually just pray with us. Um, and I'd like to close us to close our eyes and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we have a full understanding of who you are in us. That you are a Father, that you are one God, that there are no three gods that other religions and people claim to be. I thank you for this revelation that in our lives, that we are going to recognize this true Godship that you have over us and in our lives. And Father, I pray that we also accept that the true relationship that we have with, with you is, the spirit, is through the spirit of sonship so that we are able to confess you as our Father. I thank you as you open um, our minds and our hearts. I thank you as you expand our understanding I thank you as you give us a new revelation as we learn this and that we are able to do this in our lives and recognize you as the one Father who cares for us and who always wants a personal relationship with us. I pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth.